Well, um, welcome to all of you. I'm Paul Weithman of the Notre Dame Philosophy Department, and I'm chairing this session on a figure without whom uh, no discussion of justice would be complete, John Rawls, um, author of The Theory of Justice. Our format this morning is that I will introduce our speakers who will then deliver their papers. I'll, if there's time, offer some brief comments on the presentations, and then we'll open the floor to discussion. Our, um, our procedures this morning uh, are meant to stand in sharp contrast to those of the presidential debates. Um, <laughs> at, uh, at the debates, the audience was encouraged to remain silent during the presentations. Here, spontaneous eruptions of laughter and applause are encouraged. Um, second, I, I am prepared to do fact checking, <laughs> but I'll do it only after the presentations are over. Um, finally, at the debates, the moderator, as you'll recall, had full knowledge of the topics to be discussed, and the speakers were forced to extemporize. Today, just the opposite is true. Um, don't have the faintest idea of what they're going to talk about, but I may have to comment on it anyway. Um, let me now introduce our two panelists. Um, Michael Zuckert is the Nancy R. Drew Professor of Political Science at Notre Dame. He received his BA from Cornell a few years ago and his, his PhD uh, from the University of Chicago a couple of years after that. He has published Natural Rights and the New Republicanism, The Natural Rights Republic, and Launching Liberalism. He is currently writing a book about Rawls for a series on 20th century political philosophy, and he's published a number of articles about, uh, about Rawls, including an especially appreciative and knowledgeable piece on Rawls' lectures in the history of moral philosophy. David Solomon is currently a professor of philosophy here at Notre Dame. David also received his BA just a few years ago um, and his PhD from the University of Texas. His contributions to Notre Dame over the years have been enormous. He started the honors program, ran the London program, and founded the Center for Ethics and Culture, in which capacity he organized these conferences for many years. His research interests have focused on contemporary moral philosophy, especially, especially virtue theory, on which he has published a number of articles. He is widely sought out as a lecturer, and he's currently working on a, man, on a monograph on the recent revival of virtue ethics. I really appreciated that introduction, not mentioning the years of my graduation from various places. Um, also, I uh, welcome the... Uh, Gives the opportunity for applause, so I'll signal applause lines when we <laughs> come to them. Uh, <clears throat> well, as you probably know, our conference as a whole is on the topic of justice, and our panel in particular is on John Rawls, which I think is altogether fitting and proper, that is to say just, because Rawls is the most important thinker about justice of our time. But of course, he is not the first thinker to have devoted his attention to justice. That honor probably belongs to Plato, whose master work, The Republic, is a comprehensive examination of justice. I'm bringing Plato into the discussion because I believe that he helps bring out features of Rawls's theory uh, that help us both to understand and to evaluate that theory. One thing that makes them relevant to each other, I think, is that each of them faced a somewhat similar intellectual situation when they sat down to think about justice. Plato wrote in the wake of uh, the pre-Socratic philosophers and the sophists, all of whom made a distinction between nature and convention. Nature is what really is. Convention is what human beings agree to, what is only because it is agreed to. Understandably, these thinkers, the pre-Socratics, sophists, believe that what really is, that nature, has a higher claim on us as truth than what are, is merely agreed to. These thinkers saw justice as among the things merely agreed to, that is, as conventional, not natural. After all, they noticed what human beings consider just and unjust, right and wrong, varies from place to place, but what is natural always remains the same. Thus, there was a pre-Platonic brand of relativism that reflects this nature-convention divide. That is not the form of the nature convention distinction of greatest interest to Plato, however. A deeper version is expressed by his character Glaucon in The Republic. 
Glauca notices that what is considered just does not differ so greatly as the relativists claim. Pay your debts, tell the truth, respect the property of others, don't take more than your share. These and the like are held to be just pretty much everywhere. Glaucon wonders, however, whether the universality of these norms really implies that they are natural. He notices that all of these norms of justice involve some form of self-restraint, of subordinating one's own desires or claims for the sake of others. He wonders if this self-denial is really natural. He thinks it is not natural. If one could get away with it, one would rather get more for oneself. That is what nature seems actually to prompt to. It is no accident that your mother had to teach you to share um, rather than to take what you wanted. So, Glaucon concluded, justice is conventional, an agreement that most human beings come to because they are unable to get away with acting on the basis of what is truly natural. Justice, then, is an agreement by the weak to protect themselves against the strong. Rawls writes about 2,500 years later, as, or as Paul would have put it, uh, quite a few years later, uh, and he faces a similar challenge. In his time, the distinction of relevance is posed in terms of facts and values. Facts, that is claims that can be established empirically or scientifically, are real. Values, the judgments we make about good and bad, just and unjust, and so on, are merely subjective assessments added on to the facts. Such judgments are nothing objective or real. These judgments are so open to disagreement because they merely embody the variable subjective character of the persons making them. To capture reality, the task of science requires, it was thought, that we set aside and eschew values. One must be value free, that is, unconcerned with justice and such things. This doctrine more or less ruled the sphere of moral and political philosophy when Rawls began to work on his book, Theory of Justice, and is still very powerful in the social sciences today. Just as Plato tried to develop a theory of justice as something real, that is to say, natural, in the face of the nature convention distinction, so Rawls attempted to develop an account of justice as true and as scientifically valid in the face of the fact-value distinction. Rawls and Plato thus had similar agendas, although they proceeded in quite different ways and came to very different conclusions about justice. So let us first note something about their different conceptions of justice. When one asks our two authors what they uh, take justice to be, we immediately note one very large difference between them. It has to do with their manner of presenting their doctrines. Plato writes philosophic dialogues, texts which have at least as much in common with plays as with philosophic treatises. If Plato approaches poetry in his writing, Rawls is all prose. He tries to lay everything out as precisely and clearly as he can. The result of this difference is that Plato is far more charming to read, but it is not so easy to pin him down on just what he takes justice to be. Rawls, however, is more than eager to be pinned down. So let us begin with Rawls on justice. As uh, any of you know who have read Rawls, you know that he's, he argues that a just society, or what he calls a basic structure, is one governed by what he calls his two principles of justice. Principle one, you don't, you're not going to have to really remember these because I'm not going to make much of them. David may make more of them, but I thought I'd put them out here. Nothing, Nothing of them, OK. All right, so just close your ears, but I have to, one has to say this. Uh, principle one, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar liberty for others. And principle two, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both a, to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged, that's the so-called difference principle, and B, attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. Now, a society governed by Rawls's principles of justice would look quite a lot like modern liberal democracies, especially those in Europe. There would be a high level of civil liberty. There would be meritocratic competition for offices of all sorts and there would be an advanced economy with lots of redistribution. Rawls society, society would be more left-wing, I think, than America is, but America is not grossly different from what he posits as a just society. It differs mostly in having much more inequality of wealth 
and less equality of opportunity uh, than, uh, than he calls for. Of course, Plato's society looks altogether different from modern America or France. The closest thing to modern America in Plato's Republic is what Socrates calls the fevered city. This fevered city is clearly not Plato's idea of a good society. It's much more difficult to nail Plato down, for it is not clear that he is attempting to do the same sort of thing that Rawls is trying. Rawls clearly wants his principles of justice to be widely accepted and to serve as the actual basis of social life. Is that what Plato wanted? That is a very controversial question, with two quite different answers given by different readers of the Republic. Some say, yes, this is a serious proposal. He, like Rawls, wants to restructure political society to match his theory. The other answer is, this is not a serious proposal in the sense that Plato does not consider the whole scheme of the Republic as a pattern that he means to apply or to be applicable to political life. I myself incline to the second answer, and I believe there's a fair amount of textual support in the Republic for that view. For example, Socrates brings out the impossibility of the philosopher kings. The philosophers do not wish to rule, and will do so only if they are prevailed on by the non-philosophers. But the non-philosophers consider the idea of philosopher kings to be ridiculous. So they will never even attempt to prevail on the philosophers to rule. So there is a stalemate that cannot be broken. The conclusion is that the philosophers will not rule. And without that, none of the rest of the republic is possible. Of course, this raises the question, what is the point of the republic if all it does is lay out a scheme that cannot come to be? Well, one answer is that Plato's point is to show what perfect justice would be and why it can't be achieved. The republic could then teach us something important about justice and would have an important lesson for political practice. And that would be that it would be very foolish to attempt a perfectly just society. The republic begins with a variety of opinions or intuitions that human beings have about justice. Socrates subjects these uh, opinions to analytic examination and finally brings us to see that the ordinary ideas about justice contain two more fundamental intuitions, both of which find embodiment in different places in his construction of what he calls the beautiful city. One such intuition is that justice is full dedication to the common good, a dedication that does not allow one to favor oneself over others and even may require that one sacrifice oneself to uh, the common good. This line of thinking that gets Plato to that idea is the following. If we think about the rules of justice along the lines that Glaucon does, we see that these rules are constructed to serve the social good. They make peaceable living together possible. Thus, rules like keep your promises or pay your debts, whatever else may be said for them, clearly are useful for social life. Much of the Republic is based on Socrates' attempt to explore the conditions for the effectuation of justice as that which serves the common good. The problem with justice seems to be this. If justice is serving the common good, it nonetheless seems the case that human beings are at least as strongly oriented towards serving their own good, often at the expense of the common good. This is indeed what Glaucon saw when he pronounced justice merely conventional. The way human beings are constructed makes justice difficult to achieve in a thoroughgoing way. So Socrates sets out to discover what arrangements would make justice as serving the common good attainable. The answer that he arrives at is the communism of property, women, and children, together with a very severe system of education. The enemy of justice is the tendency to favor oneself and one's own. But if one has nothing that is one's own, there is no temptation or possibility to favor one's own. The citizens of the Republic are thus freed up to be completely dedicated to the good of the whole. The other intuition about justice is captured in formulas like um, justice is rendering to each his own or his due, or to each what is fitting or suitable. You might notice that this is a rather different notion from the first one, but equally primordial with it. The notion of justice as service to the common good leads Socrates to the rejection of whatever is private or one's own, 
But this other notion of justice implies there are things that are rightly one's own. Perhaps the most common reformulation of this intuition is in terms of merit. Each should get what he or she deserves or merits. This is perhaps our second most commonsensical notion of justice, for we have a very difficult time thinking about justice without thinking of dessert. One should receive the grade one deserves. This is a very common thought about justice in a university setting. But one of Plato's points is to show that when you think about justice as merit or desert, you need to raise an issue that is hidden inside the idea of deserving like one of those Russian dolls. If justice is giving to each what he or she merits, one must actually mean something like this. Justice is rendering to each what is good for him or her. The thought that leads to the good from deserving is the observation that to reward someone means to give them something good, good for them. Not necessarily what they happen to think good, but what is really and truly good. For it would not be a reward to give, something, uh, give somebody something bad or harmful. The question about justice then becomes the question about the human good. These notions of merit or desert and the good are also prominently present in the Republic. So Socrates posits that there are three different types of persons, gold, silver, and bronze, who merit different allocations or positions in a just society. Thus, the class structure of the Republic is justified or shown to be just. <coughs> it is not merely a random or arbitrary assignment of positions that leads some into ruling and others into subordinate positions. Now, probably the most famous part of the Republic, the philosopher Kings, reflects the way the issue of merit translates into the issue of the good. If justice requires giving to each what is good, one cannot depend on mechanisms of distribution like markets or contracts because these do not pay any attention to the true good. One needs a source of allocation that knows the true good. Knowledge of the good, presumably the possession of the philosophers, is the claim and indeed suggested to be the only proper claim to rule. The philosophers allocate the good to all the others and embody the notion of justice as dessert in their own assignment to rule. At bottom then, the Republic leads up to the thought that justice has two points of reference. The common good, that is the good of the community, and the individual good, the true good for a human being. But are these two points of reference identical or even compatible and harmonious? Plato's answer, appears to be no, for he shows, a, he shows us what it would take to engineer the convergence between the two, and then shows that to be impossible. The formula for justice in the Republic that is to make for this convergence is one man, one job. Every individual is to be assigned a particular kind of job in the city, a job that the city needs to have done. If all the jobs are done unstintingly and wholeheartedly, with no holding back, then each is serving the common good by doing his part. At the same time, each is assigned the job suitable for him or her, not only in the sense of ability to perform it, but in the sense of being suited to the good of that individual. However, Plato indicates that this convergence is a fiction. It is precisely this convergence that brings what Socrates calls the noble lie into existence. That is to say, he indicates to us that the convergence is a myth. So Plato shows us something about the nature of justice, even as he shows us something about the limits of justice. Another way to say, see the problem here is to notice that Socrates admits that the citizens of his city, completely dedicated to the common good, may not be happy. Indeed, their happiness is dismissed as irrelevant. That fact shows that there's a gap between the two notions of justice. What the common good requires may not be good for the individual, and vice versa. The unworkability of the Republic's scheme of justice does not mean that at the end of the day Glaucon was right about justice when he said that justice to, as service to the common good is all convention and that the natural individual good is the reverse of what we think of as justice. That is what Glaucon calls conventional justice. Socrates shows that Glaucon is simply mistaken in what he thinks the true natural good for a human being is. It is philosophy not the desire for more goods or the desire to rule over others. That is not quite the same as justice as the common good, but it is not the overturning of it. Now, obviously, Rawls considers justice much easier to achieve than Plato does. He thinks a fundamentally just society to be attainable. 
And that leads us to raise this question. What accounts for that difference between Plato and Rawls? The answer, I think, comes in two phases. Rawls rightly identifies himself as a member of the liberal tradition. And as such, he takes for granted some of the important things the pre-existing liberal tradition has done in moving away from the platonic understanding of justice. But Rawls then, I'm going to argue in a second phase, substantially modifies the liberal tradition he has inherited in order to arrive at his particular version of a liberal theory of justice. The first phase in the move away from Plato was accomplished by early modern political philosophers like John Locke. The chief Locke move that Locke makes is to sever the theme of justice more or less completely from the theme of the good. Thus, Locke argues that justice is respecting and securing the rights of human beings. The true good of human beings, while a question of great interest and importance, is not a question central to the problem of justice. With the severing of the just or the right and the good, Locke is ex has excised one of the major emphases in Plato's discussion and one of the sources of difficulty in achieving justice. What leads Locke to jettison this great concern with the good that was so central to Plato and so much a part of the common sense grasp of justice? That's a larger question than I can uh, answer here, but a rough and ready answer is something like this. Locke raises a different question from the one that Plato raises. He lived in an era of religious and other sorts of civil warfare in which various groups attempted to impose on others their conception of the human good, particularly conceptions of religious good. Locke saw this imposition and counter-imposition as disastrous and dangerous and asked the simple question, what justifies human beings in imposing coercion on others? That question led, led him to analyze political life in such a way as to see human beings as rights-possessing beings who had only one legitimate original source of a right to coerce others, that being to protect their own and others' rights. The achievement of the true good, so no matter how good a thing it is, does not justify the use of coercion against others. Since the state is the agency that applies coercion, Locke concluded it must be limited in its legitimate business to securing rights and the conditions for the securing of rights. Locke dropped the concern with the good and thus avoided Glaucon's way of posing the question of nature and convention. But he and the subsequent liberal tradition did maintain an important feature of Plato's discussion, although in a very modified form. Recall that merit or desert was a key part of Plato's conception. Locke retains this notion as the just rule of distribution for material goods. According to Locke, one of our rights is the right of self-ownership. We own our bodies and the actions of our bodies. Thus, it is wrong to destroy or harm the bodies of others and wrong to steal the actions, that is to say, the labor of the bodies of others. Our ownership of our own labor implies we have a right to the fruits of our labor, which fruits are typically achieved within cooperative ventures with others in a complex economy marked by a division of labor. We enter into agreements to exchange our labor for other goods, and according to Locke and the liberals who follow him, the just distribution of goods in society is the distribution that follows from the workings of markets in labor and goods, at least most of the time. Locke's point is not only that this is economically efficient, but that it is just. It is just because it is the distribution that results from respecting the basic rights of persons. The classical liberal view, then, is that one deserves or merits what one earns in the market because one is a self-owner and justice is primarily respect for one's rights as self-owner. That is, desert or merit is derivative from self-ownership, but is nonetheless a central component of liberal justice. Thus, we tend to think that the results of fair competition are just. May the fastest runner win. May the best entrepreneur thrive in such like thoughts. Much of American society, in fact, is set up according to standards <coughs> like these. Now, Rawls' second step is based on an assault against the idea of merit or desert. He argues that we never naturally merit or deserve anything because those qualities that allow us to achieve our achievements are not themselves deserved. For example, nobody deserves the greater intelligence that allows them to invest more wisely. No one deserves the stronger passing arm or keen eye that allows them to be an NFL quarterback. Notre Dame example. Uh, since nobody deserves the talents or resources that lead to success in the market, 
market distributions, to say nothing of the platonic class structure, cannot be said to be just. They are merely as arbitrary as the arbitrary distribution of talent in society. So Rawls denies that market distributions have any claim on us, whatever. We can throw the entire social product into a pot and distribute it not according to, uh, uh, sorry, distribute it not according to arbitrary talents, but according to some rational rule. For example, according to the rules of justice that he puts forward. So Rawls can consider justice more easily achieved than Plato does because he has, in effect, excised the elements of justice that Plato showed to be in tension with each other. He rejects the idea that justice is devotion to the public good because he rejects the idea that justice can require self-sacrifice. He rejects the good because he is skeptical that there is such a thing as a natural good for a human being. He rejects merit because he doubts that anybody actually deserves anything, even those things most is or her own. Plato sought to understand justice as natural uh, by following out the intimations in our natural understanding of it. These intimations led him to see justice as a goal, never to be sought, never to be achieved, because justice, uh, sorry, because nature sets limits that we cannot overleap. Paul believes he can accomplish so much more because he has jettisoned nature as a standard altogether. Neither the natural good nor natural merit has anything to do with it. We are free from the limits imposed by nature, free to construct freely, and thus to achieve what Plato thought impossible. Now, it would take far more time than I have to provide an adequate consideration of Rawls's position on justice, but let me just mention one commonly noted self-contradiction in his system that Paul will perhaps take issue with that seems to me to undermine his theory. On the one hand, Rawls rejects the common idea that justice is subordinating oneself to the good of others or the social whole because he believes each individual must be considered as an end in himself, not to be put into the service of others. This is a minimal requirement of justice, he thinks. On the other hand, he denies that any of us truly own our talents and abilities, and thus he claims that our productive powers can be justly harnessed to serve the needs of those less well off than we are. According to his difference principle, we are not ends in ourselves, but agents for the good of others. In a way, Rawls thus reproduces the tension Plato calls attention to in his treatment of justice, but there is, I think, a major difference. Plato is fully aware of the problems, and brings it out, or brings them out, I should say, to educate us about why justice is a problem and not an achievement. Rawls, I think, is less aware of this self-contradiction as a problem. He believes justice, as he presents it, can be achieved. But his self-contradiction shows that he cannot succeed, at least at developing a theory of justice uh, of the sort that he tries to develop. So it's hard not to conclude that Plato, with his sobering awareness of the limits of justice, is a better guide than Rawls. Thank you. There is, uh, can you hear me in the back of the room? I've spent many miserable lectures in this room at the back when I couldn't hear anybody. So if, if, if uh, the mics quit working, raise your hand. There are m multiple ironies in Paul Weithman chairing this session on Rawls and somebody like me uh, uh, having a, giving a paper in it. I mean, basically my view of Rawls' theory is that he sort of doubles down on all the major mistakes in modern moral philosophy <laughs> and becomes rich and famous as a result of that. Paul was uh, uh, a student of mine as an undergraduate, um, as it seems to me, as the years go by, almost everyone was. Uh, I, I did my best in educating Rawls, uh, educating Paul, to inoculate him, him against these errors. He uh, graduated from Notre Dame, went off to Harvard, set at the feet of uh, John Rawls, and has become one of the most uh, uh, articulate interpreters of Rawls and defenders of his view. Once again, the heartbreak of pedagogy. When one, uh, <laughs> so, so the fact that the, the, my revenge on Paul, I suppose, is he will have to sit here and listen to me and tell uh, pointless anecdotes about uh, the Rawls that I knew. Uh, I, I'm glad that Michael talked uh, a lot about the content of Rawls' views, because I'm not going 
to talk much much about that. Uh, I have talked a lot about it, and I have a lot of things to say about it. But to tell you the truth, after 40 years, I'm just kind of tired of it. Uh, the the theory's been out there. We've been, I want to talk about the cultural significance of Rawls, which I think has a lot to do with, uh, with this conference and why it's a conference about justice and why justice is so important today. So I'm going to talk about uh, talk about that, and I will be at a couple of points, uh, maybe excessively anecdotal, but it seems to me that's a uh, that needs to be done in talking about some of these matters. It's also uh, the, the these remarks I'm making this morning grow out of a couple of things. One, a, a symposium we had some years ago on Rawls' death, where I was sort of reflecting on his significance in that way, which made me nicer to him than I would otherwise have been, and also a kind of long-standing interest I have in uh, exploring the relationship between Anglophone academic moral philosophy and broader cultural questions, and Rawls is a pivotal figure in that. So my apolo uh, apology for what I'm about to talk about. Now I'll read. It's unthinkable that a conference on justice at this moment in the history of philosophy would not find room for a session on the work of John Rawls. A theory of justice, when it was published in 1971, changed the landscape not only of political philosophy, but also of practical thought more generally, and especially of the relation of academic reflection on moral and political matters, that relation to broader cultural matters. That's a claim I'm going to try to make good on. In my brief remarks this morning, I want to reflect generally on the larger cultural impact of Rawls' work, especially of the theory of justice. I will not be adding to the massive collection of secondary work that explores the internals, as it were, of Rawls' arguments in the theory of justice and subsequent works. I want rather to explore the story of Rawls' impact on late 20th century culture and inquire briefly about how that impact might be assessed. Stephen Toulman wrote an article some time ago entitled How Medicine Saved Moral Philosophy. The thesis of the piece was that moral philosophy had become so moribund by the 1960s, and I mean academic moral philosophy and mainly in the English-speaking world, so caught up in inward-looking methodological squabbles and largely irrelevant epistemic and semantic quarrels that only the experience of being forced to deal with some of the genuine and deep moral difficulties in medicine, abortion, allocation of scarce resources, the ethics of human experimentation, and so forth, saved moral philosophers from boring even themselves to death. A few years earlier, Peter Lazlitt had declared that political philosophy was dead, and many seem to think that where political philosophy goes, moral philosophy cannot be far behind. The moral philosophers whose thought was, uh, whose thought was dominant in that period could hardly, of course, be accused of not living up to their ambitions since their ambitions were so meager. One of their central claims was that moral philosophy was morally neutral, hence largely morally irrelevant to the normative disputes of contemporary culture, and their own work seemed to demonstrate that uh, this was no idle boast. When I was a student of moral philosophy in the 1960s, I, I always think that's sort of one of the great strikes against my seriousness as a human being that I came to be interested in ethics at a time when it was so unpromising. After all, the Western world had just gone through a Great Depression, two world wars, fighting against two monstrous totalitarianisms, and moral philosophy around universities had hardly noticed throughout the 20th century. I think that's not an unfair claim. I have never, in the English-speaking academic world, I've never been exactly sure what to make of Toulmin's thesis, although the part about academic moral philosophy having, for the most part, withdrawn from cultural engagement in the decades leading up to the 1960s is so obviously true that he should get no credit for pointing it out. Whether it was medicine and its problems that saved moral philosophy from itself, however, is far from clear. Another leading candidate for the role of savior, and a more plausible one, I think, is found in the person of John Rawls, though his salvage operation has a curious history, one I'm going to talk about. Rawls' career extends over the last half of the 20th century, from his earliest piece, Outline of a Decision Procedure for Ethics, which he published in the early 1950s, to his final attempt to bolster his final attempts to bolster his call for an overlapping consensus in support of political procedure and structures that will allow persons to flourish in a world the most prominent feature of which is the fact of reasonable pluralism, his final struggles before his death. One has the sense 
that Rawls felt more urgency about making his work convincing as his career reached its final years. The earlier work exudes a kind of calm confidence that Rawlsian reasonableness will ultimately prevail, while later in his career, Rawls' tone becomes more hectoring and his impatience with those who refuse to recognize the good sense of political liberalism more evident. Or at least that's my reading of this. We may have disagreements about it, that matter of tone. It was frequently said by those who knew Rawls better personally than I did that he remained active in the Harvard Department of Philosophy even after the onset of the serious medical problems of his last years, largely to save the young men and women of Harvard from the views of Michael Sandel, who will be on our program uh, later today, and some others who were chipping away at Rawls' staunch defense of his version of political liberalism. I'd like to focus on these brief remarks then on some aspects of the enormous influence Rawls' work had on contemporary culture. And not just academic culture, but the larger culture within which discussion, debate, and deliberation concerning the most pressing normative issues takes place, the kind of discussion we typically have at this conference. I will explore answers to two different questions central to any examination of Rawls' uh, cultural impact. First, the question of the impact of the publication of Rawls' Theory of Justice in 1971, and second, the question of the likely ultimate significance of Rawls' work as seen against the broader sweep of the history of moral and political philosophy. Will Rawls still be read a century from now? If not, will he nevertheless be regarded as a major figure in shaping the political thought of the next century? Or will Rawls be rather a minor figure? And how minor? More like Mill or T.H. Green, Sir William Hamilton or W.G. Ward? Will he, like Sidgwick, be a crucially important figure for professional moral philosophers, but largely forgotten by the educated public in general? Or will school children be introduced to the distinction between political conceptions and comprehensive theories when they learn their eights tables? Of course, since students, I understand, don't learn their eights tables anymore, probably I should drop that point. To the first question then, what was the impact of a theory of justice in 1971? I can assure you, I was alive at that time. It is difficult to describe to those who did not live through it the enormous impact that the publication of Rawls' The Theory of Justice had on the academy and on the culture when it appeared in the spring, well, in 1971, really came to us in the spring of 1972. Uh, Rawls had published his first article in 1951, the same year in which Alistair McIntyre, a career, a remarkable career, Remarkable master's thesis was completed. A nice comparison there, which I will not explore. But Rawls had published little during the two decades that followed that article. We were kind of worried about him. He got tenure at Harvard and all that, but you know, we didn't uh, hear much about Rawls. The world of academic moral philosophy in the English speaking universities was dominated during that 20 year period from 1951 to 1971. Uh, by discussion of a set of semantic questions that hope to shed some light on moral deliberation and debate by analyzing the moral concepts, as we said at the time. The heroes of this period were the White's Professor of Moral Philosophy at Oxford, R.M. Hare, and such other Oxford figures as it's very much an Anglo-driven period of moral philosophy. Such other Oxford figures as my mentor, Philip Foote, G.J. and Mary Warnock, Patrick Noel Smith, along with American philosophers like Bill Franken and Charles Stevenson, Richard Grant, and others. For much of the 60s, when I was a student of moral philosophy, Rawls was rumored to be working on a big book on moral philosophy. And there were various dittoed copies. These were before the days of Xerox. It was hard to get a copy of things. We had these dittoed copies with the blue ink rubbing off on our fingers of Rawls' manuscripts, I still have some in my file cabinets, circulated and being traded the way later students traded Grateful Dead or fish uh, bootlegs. Uh, the, uh, and the rumors were something big was happening at Harvard. It's fair to say, however, that many of us were unconvinced that Rawls would be a world beater. I was always a grumpy Aristotelian and didn't expect much. He gave the natural, but I had no right to have expectations of one sort or another. He gave the natural law lecture. Here's a warning. This is a personal anecdote. Here, during my first year on the faculty in 1969, and Mike Lux, my colleague, and I were the only members of the philosophy department who attended. Here was John Rawls, 1969, giving the natural law lecture on the sense of justice. 
one of his big ideas. We were joined by only three or four other faculty members in an unair conditioned room in the law school in a hot spring day in which we mostly dozed through a long and to me tedious Rawlsian exploration of the sense of justice. Those of you who ever heard Rawls' lecture will know he was not God's gift to rhetorical uh, says. The question period came suddenly upon us, and we were all at a loss for a question and were sort of roused from this slumber. But we were saved by my colleague, uh, Professor Rhodes of the law school. Bob Rhodes isn't here today, is he? He shows up in strange places, as at this lecture, and it's still going strong. Bob Rhodes asked a question, calling for Rawls to tidy up one of the famous, his famous taxonomies. The particular question is a, is a typical, for those of you who know uh, Bob Rhodes, a Rhodes question. He asked Rawls to relate his two principles of justice that Michael referred to, to the notions of a natural aristocracy and an ideal feudal system of social organization. Uh, Rhodes wanted to know, Rawls said, couldn't these two principles be embodied if we really got Thomism right? That question, the only question of the day, not only <laughs> saved the audience from the extreme embarrassment of unanimous silence in response to this coming great man, but also earned Bob Rhodes a footnote on page 74 of A Theory of Justice uh, <laughs> and the notoriety that came with a mention in that book. When Bob Rhodes was given his endowed chair a few years ago, I suggested that it was largely because of that footnote <laughs> in A Theory of Justice. To be in the index of A Theory of Justice was uh, to have your career made. I often wonder, indeed, <laughs> what the consequences for my own academic career might have been had I not dozed so deeply on that warm spring afternoon. Now the contrast between that badly attended and sleepy occasion and a famous symposium that, again, an anecdote warning, that I attended at Oxford University in the fall of 1972 when I was on leave at Oxford after the publication of A Theory of Justice the previous summer could hardly have been greater three years later. That lecture course at, at Harvard, or at Oxford, was conducted by three prominent intellectuals, Stuart Hampshire, a uh, very eminent philosopher, whose rave review of a, theory of, a justice, of a Theory of Justice had appeared in the New York Review of Books in the summer of 1972, a review in which he had compared Rawls to Plato, Rousseau, Hume, Kant, Adam Smith, Mill, and Sidgwick, and suggested that a theory of justice might be the most important book in political philosophy since Hobbes' Leviathan. The other teachers in this symposium were Amartya Sen, later to win a Nobel Prize in economics, and Bill Diggs, a less known but very eminent utilitarian philosopher who was on leave at Oxford that year uh, from Illinois. This course met once a week, a typical Oxford course during the eight week term, and everyone attended. I mean, everyone attended. Uh, people took trains down from London. Members of parliament were there. Everybody was there. Oxford's an international university anyway. Lots of people from third world countries at the time struggling with colonialism. It was sort of like being at a UN session. Uh, the course was moved almost every week in order to accommodate the huge crowds attending. And when we got it finally to the largest auditorium in Oxford, in what's called schools there, we still had people hanging out the windows. Uh, what's most memorable about that class is not the presentations of Sen, Hampshire, and Diggs, which in the best academic fashion both praised and picked at Rawls in the way we do. Uh, Diggs arguing that Rawls was too hard on utilitarianism, Hampshire arguing that he was too easy on Kant, and Sen claiming that he didn't know enough economics. That was sort of how the course went. But what was memorable was the sense in the room that here was something new and important going on, or at least a return to something old, which had been neglected for so long that it seemed new and important. Now, what was new and what was going on with this book? Michael's given us a good sense of the content of it. Rawls had written, the first thing, Rawls had written in A Theory of Justice a big book. When ethics had become, in the 1960s, the province of the article, of the kind of problem, of the particular issue, and the short technical book. It was also, I thought, especially in British circles, becoming almost cloyingly cute. Philosophers were getting kind of precious in ways. Some of you will remember classic articles like J.O. Urmson's uh, article he co-authored co with, with Hare called On Grading. 
the classic article of the time, which compared valuation to the grading of apples and drew in an intentionally droll manner on that British apple grader's manual. Uh, fine, super fine, all these sort of jokes about apple grading. Uh, someone else wrote an, wrote an article drawing on the manual of evaluating sewage effluent in the uh, Oxford uh, uh, sewage system. Uh, or J.L. Austin's great article, one of the great philosophers of the day, called Ifs and Cans, with its maddeningly precious opening sentence, are cans constitutionally iffy? I mean, this was the kind of <laughs> thing where you got two ears and a tail in philosophy at the time. Now, Rawls has been frequently criticized on many grounds, of course, but I don't think he's ever been accused of being too cute. A Theory of Justice was a long, deadly serious, and humorless book as befits an ambitious book aimed at changing the world. Second thing about a theory of justice, Rawls utterly ignored the technical meta-ethics that had dominated Anglophone academic moral philosophy in the post-war years. He mentioned Hare's work, the great man of the time, only in a couple of footnotes. And I assure you Hare was very upset and angry about this. He paid no attention to the naturalistic fallacy, the open question argument. He engaged not at all the debate between cognitivists and non-cognitivists and barely mentioned the fact value problem. These were the issues that had dominated moral philosophy for three quarters of a century. He disposed of the dominant methodological tradition in 20th century, all these boring guys, these 20th century Anglophone moral philosophy in a single paragraph buried in the middle of the book in a chapter entitled, unassumingly, Some Remarks on Moral Theory. Just one quote, the only quote I'll give you from Rawls. This is what he says there. A theory of justice is subject to the same rules of method as other theories. Definitions and analyses of meaning do not have a special place. Definition is but one device used in setting up the general structure of theory. This is after philosophers had been talking about the meaning of moral terms for three quarters of a century. Once the whole framework is worked out, Definitions have no distinct status, and they stand or fall with the theory itself. In any case, it's obviously impossible to develop a substantive theory of justice founded solely on truths of logic and definition. Again, the very thing moral philosophers have been defending. The analysis of moral concepts in the a priori, however, tradition, however traditionally understood, is too slender a basis. Moral philosophy must be free to use contingent assumptions and general facts as it pleases. There is no other way to give an account of our considered judgments than reflective equilibrium. This is the conception of the subject adopted by most classical British writers through Sidgwick, that is, through the end of the 19th century. I see no reason to depart from it. But that paragraph marks Rawls' departure from everything that had happened from Sidgwick up to the day before he published this book, from 1900 to 1971. A third point. Rawls were, and about the excitement, Rawls work also engaged the history of moral philosophy in a way that had almost disappeared from the work of moral philosophers. I'm not going to make much of this point, but it's an important one. Even for those of us who didn't like his Whiggish history, everything's an ascent to Kant, we were impressed that he at least took history seriously. He cast his work as a free formulation and updating of a Kantian approach to the foundational questions of ethics and politics and deliberately eschewing the classical tradition of Plato and Aristotle, as Michael pointed out, and in opposition to what he took to be the dominant moral conception of the last hundred years, utilitarianism. Uh, on this, he was, uh, well, let me skip, we don't need to go into that. Uh, he invokes in his work Kant and Rousseau, Mill and Adam Smith, even Aristotle and Sidgwick as kind of precursors. He locates his view in this tradition. But the fourth point about the excitement in that seminar room, but by far the most important new feature of Rawls' book and what made those crowds come was that he recalled moral philosophy and political philosophy to their traditional cultural role of reflectively examining the intellectual foundations of the institutions and priorities of culture. In Rawls' case, the focus was clearly on the institutions and practices, as Michael pointed out, of modern liberal democratic culture. He said, we've got to go back to talking about that stuff. The middle third of the theory of justice was given over to a penetrating and powerful discussion of concrete questions about civil disobedience, economic justice, and social equality. All issues that had been on our cultural agenda throughout the new tumultuous decade of the 60s, through which Walt Rawls had just lived, but had been absent almost completely from the work of academic moral philosophy. We had ignored it completely. 
Peter Singer, uh, a student of Hare's at Oxford, and later to become famous for his engagement with culture and defense of infanticide, animal rights, and lots of other things, attended the Rawls Seminar uh, Symposium with me 30 years ago. We were uh, friends early in our careers and sharing some seminars we were attending that year. And Singer, a year later, wrote a piece for the New York Times Magazine entitled, I think tellingly, Philosophers Back on the Job. The article was a celebration of what moral philosophy could be if the Rawlsian approach to the subject were adopted. And it's significant that it appeared in the New York Times Magazine instead of being hidden in some academic journal somewhere. It was actually published where people read it, as we say in philosophy, real people. Uh, Singer was seeking converts in that piece to a cultural crusade, a new role for a philosopher and a shocking one in the early 1960s, I think, Philosopher is kind of evangelist for reason. This piece appeared on July 7th, 1974. It's a victory call, joyfully announcing the end of a long period of irrelevance and stagnation of philosophy and philosophers. It explains how philosophy had broken free of an overly rigid scientism and fixation on linguistic analysis in the first half of the 20th century, and how, now that these pathologies are overcome, Philosophy can venture into debates about real morality and politics and take its proper place in political and cultural discussions. This development, Singer suggests, holds great promise for a people previously bound to political leaders like Nixon. I mean, it's the season of Watergate, so you had to talk about Nixon, and sexually obsessed priests as bastions of moral authority. So we dump Nixon and priests, and we take on reason and Rawls has, Rawls has shown us how to do it. He cites Rawls, the theory of justice, as showing the way back to relevance on the part of moral philosophy. Now, there's, there's already a sort of poison pill embedded in the Singer piece in that he's celebrating all this Rawlsian revolution of making philosophy relevant, but of course he despises Rawls' Kantianism and is about to inject into this discussion a completely different, he thinks reason leads us in a completely different direction, in the direction of utilitarianism, but that's, that's the develop, that's the, develops as the story goes on. What Rawls offers in order to bring about this revolution is a method, this is according to Singer, that allows moral philosophers to develop genuine normative theories grounded in reason and able to withstand criticism from competing theories that can, one, provide substantive guides for action, no more moral neutrality of the hair variety, and two, pr produce substantial moral criticism of human institutions and practices, which Rawls and his students were very interested in doing. Rawls' method, the method of reflective equilibrium, offers moral philosophers a route back to cultural significance. The method of wide reflective equilibrium, as adumbrated and deployed in a theory of justice, has the effect of legitimizing the fledgling movement uh, at that time in the direction of philosophy-based applied ethics. In 1970, there were virtually no journals publishing philosophical work in applied ethics, medical ethics, business ethics, environmental ethics, of certainly any of an intellectually high quality. By 1980, there were scores of such journals. In 1970, there were virtually no tenured faculty members in philosophy departments of the first rank that published on applied issues. It was sort of a death knell for your career to get uh, in, to involved. Although Chris Englehart's in the audience is someone who did well early on in bringing medicine and philosophy. Uh, together. By 1980, there were many active contributors to applied discussions. It was Rawls, surely more than any other philosopher, who made these developments, for better or for worse, possible. In his discussion of toleration and civil disobedience, he modeled such discussions. In the method of reflective equilibrium, as I said, he developed a method for them. In his disdain for classical metaethics, he removed barriers to their relevance. In the calm and thorough manner in which he discussed controversial issues, he inspired confidence. Even when we were puzzled by what Rawls really meant by the reasonable, one of the most difficult notions, I think, in his thought, we had to admit that he seemed to embody it. His patrician manner, and such for a southern boy like me from the sticks, this sort of Harvard-trained Yankee who's sort of all cool, and his patrician manner didn't hurt either. He immediately struck one, so I thought, as not only a man of superior abilities and attainments, but also of a man utterly confident 
of his superiority. A very nice guy, but yeah. Um, that added a special charm to his attempts to ameliorate, as Michael talked about it, the inegalitarian results of the natural lottery. That is, some people can throw a curveball and others can't. It was strangely reassuring that a man so determined to fight the natural lottery, as Rawls calls it, was also so obviously a beneficiary of it. Uh, <laughs> Rawls, more than any other single moral philosopher in the last half century, changed the landscape of moral and political philosophy. The only competitor for this role is, in the Anglophone world at least, is uh, our colleague here at Notre Dame, Alistair McIntyre, from whom you'll be hearing uh, after lunch. What will history make of this change and his role in it? Here it seems to me difficult to say. For things have not yet, are not always gone so smoothly for the Rawls machine after a very promising start. Beneath the patrician manner and the immaculate seersucker sport coat, Rawls was forced to sweat a bit in his later years. He opened the door for the construction of large scale traditional normative theories, but he was not able to close it quickly enough after he got through. His brilliantly revived neo Kantian normative theory was followed within a decade by brilliantly revived natural law theories by, among others, John Finnis, whom you'll also be hearing from at this conference, by consequentialist theories, by highly skilled philosophers like Derek Parfit, Shelley Kagan, Sam Scheffler, and others. Also by brilliantly revived Aristotelian theories by people like McIntyre and his friends, following in the footsteps of the early work of Elizabeth Anscombe, and later by brilliantly revived neo natian anti-theories by people like Richard Rorty. Bernard Williams, and other naysayers. From a paucity of normative theory in Anglophone academic moral philosophy up through the 60s, the 80s and 90s presented us with an overabundance. Classical metaethics prior to Rawls made moral philosophy irrelevant to culture. Post Rawls, the normative theorizing made moral philosophy a vehicle for every cultural impulse, large scale or small. For every wobble in the cultural ether, philosophers were prepared to deliver a comprehensive theory after, after Rawls. Rawls wanted moral philosophy to bring consensus and agreement to cultural conflict and uncertainty. Agreement on the truth, yet to be fair, at least early on, I think, that was his view. The revolution he unleashed, however, seemed to empower philosophy to merely reproduce in elegantly deployed theoretical structures cultural disagreement. Instead of bringing authoritative consensus to culture on the deepest problems, Rawls seemed to license and legitimize disagreement and conflict under the name of respecting the fact of reasonable pluralism. His increasingly radical attempts to bring everyone, no matter how deep their disagreements, under the umbrella of a single theoretical structure led to the thin political liberalism of his last decade and to what must have seemed to Rawls the ultimate insult of being regarded by Richard Rorty and other philosophers like him, uh, most notably in Rorty's The Priority of Democracy and Philosophy, a famous interpretive piece about Rawls, uh, regarded by Richard Rorty as just another light-minded ironist celebrating the priority of democracy to philosophy. I mean, this, this is what Rawls lived to see. Alistair McIntyre, near the end of Whose Justice, Which Rationality, tells the tale of how political liberalism, which started, here's political liberalism, the movement, not Rawls' book, Political liberalism, which started life as a political approach aimed at bringing consensus to a divided world, ended up as a theoretical structure for managing, indeed celebrating, disagreement and diversity. Similarly, a critic of Rawls might say that his career beginning, it began in the attempt to place reason in the service of remedying the chaos of the 1960s, say, but it, it ended up articulating the impulse that made that 60s chaos possible. It's interesting, in, in conclusion, to compare Rawls in this regard to Henry Sidgwick in these matters. Rawls and Sidgwick, Sidgwick the great 19th Victorian utilitarian philosophy, philosopher in England. Rawls and Sidgwick share many features. Sidgwick dominated English-speaking moral philosophy in the last half of the 19th century, much the way Rawls did in our philosophical culture in the 20th. Like Rawls, Sidgwick pursued single-mindedly an attempt to bring consensus to a community of free and equal persons riven by moral disagreement. His great work, The Methods of Ethics, this is Sidgwick's great work, uh, which he revised for over 30 years and through seven editions, involves Sidgwick in retreating to a thinner and thinner view 
in an attempt to make its arguments ultimately compelling to all reasonable persons. Sidgwick was finally unable to overcome a deep fissure in practical reason, a contradiction at the heart of his system. And he was driven in his last sad days to pursue psychical research in hopes of finding some empirical information about the future life that could reconcile practical reason with itself and the demands of egoism and with those of utilitarianism. Sidgwick founds the British Psychical Society, partly as a result of his philosophical despair. He failed to find this evidence, uh, and he died a broken man. The failure of Sidgwick's project, glorious as it was, ushered in the project, not the failure, uh, ushered in the era of lessened ambitions for academic moral philosophy, when his student G.E. Moore, Sidgwick's student, initiated the tradition of classical metaethics and led moral philosophy into the wilderness of irrelevance and self-absorption where it wandered for 60 years. Now that paragraph is filled with controversial claims about the history of contemporary moral philosophy, but I'm prepared to defend them all. I think there is some. Rawls, I suspect, must have wondered in his later years whether his work might meet a similar fate, Sidgwick's. Might he, like Sidgwick, by aiming too high, end up convincing too few and consequently achieving too little? And while Sidgwick was punished by living long enough to read Moore's Principia Ethica, Rawls must have found, feared that his legacy was to pave the way for Rortian ironism, as I said before. Not only was Rawls incapable of being cute, he was no fan of irony either. And it, it's surely too soon to write a comprehensive history of Rawls' influence and the way the story played out. It's already clear, however, that things have not turned out quite as Rawls envisioned and as Singer celebrated in that heady 1974 article. Applied ethics, which Rawls did so much to inspire, while a minor growth industry in philosophy is widely regarded, I would judge, as an unsightly blemish for the most part on the profession rather than a contribution to the culture to be celebrated. Again, another controversial claim, but one I think shared by many. While Anglophone academic philosophers are more significant cultural figures now than that they were before Rawls wrote, they are not widely celebrated for bringing reason consensus to our deepest cultural conflicts, but rather for intensifying them, I would say, and making our conflicts seem, as McIntyre has remarked, not difficult to resolve, but impossible to resolve. We can leave unanswered on this occasion, at least, the question of whether medicine saved moral philosophy or whether Rawls did or whether perhaps it hasn't been saved at all. I suspect that Rawls would think, in any event, that the more important question is whether moral philosophy can save us. That was what he was interested in. And unfortunately for Rawls, who works so diligently to show that it can, at least in some one of its forms, the jury still remains, it still remains in my opinion, out on that question as well. Thank you. When, um, when Rawls learned that I was from Notre Dame, um, he, uh, he told me about that hot spring afternoon. <laughs> he did not resent that there were just three or four people in the audience. He, um, in fact, always was surprised that more than three or four people were interested in his work. What he did tell me was that that hot spring day was Good Friday, and that the person who had invited him to speak at Notre Dame on Good Friday was John Noonan. And Rawls said to me, there was a time, he said, when I was really quite serious about this. He said, I, I no longer keep track of when Good Friday falls. But he said, I thought if anyone would know when Good Friday was, it was John Noonan. <laughs> Um, like, uh, like Michael, I see significant differences between Rawls and Plato, but I locate it differently in part perhaps because I see some interesting similarities between them. Um, recall that according to Michael, Plato thinks that justice isn't attainable because, as he put it, what the common good requires might not be good for individuals. Now, so stated, the problem that Plato saw is familiar to anyone who has even a passing acquaintance with collective action problems. Prisoners' dilemmas and tragedies of the commons are all around us. It's a sad but familiar fact that individual and collective rationality can come apart. And the tension between individual and collective rationality, between what's good for all and what's good for the individual, 
um, arises in Plato, in Sidgwick, and in Rawls, that albeit that the tension arises from different sources. Um, here, and I defer to, to Michael's expertise, in Plato, the tension arises from, um, in the, uh, between the demands of the common good on the one hand and the desire for what we merit on the other. In Sidgwick, and here I defer to David, um, the tension arises from egoism and its opposite. In Rawls, the tension arises from between, um, uh, the tension is between the demands of principles chosen in a common point of view, namely the original position, and a range of desires stemming from self-interest, beliefs about desert, and many other sources. Well, I think the, the real difference then between Plato and Rawls may be that Rawls thinks that at least in a just society, the demands of individual and collective rationality, the schism um, in practical reason, can be overcome, at least to some extent. And it can be overcome because a just society suits our nature as free and equal rational beings. If, um, if Rawls is not cute and rarely poetic, his remarks about, how we, about our nature and about how we can realize it by giving principles of justice first priority are, I think, quite moving. Um, I won't read them to you, I thought of doing it, but I invite, invite you to, to consult them for your, uh, look at them for yourselves. I, I at least find them bordering on the lyrical. I, I do think that Rawls had somewhat um, lower ambitions than David thought he had. Um, what he hoped to accomplish, I think, from the beginning of his career to the end, was um, to lay out a conception of justice that could um, uh, settle disputes about the essentials of a just constitution in the sort of society in which we live. I don't think he thought that philosophy would come to an end, that debates about the good would come to an end, that people like Richard Rorty and Peter Singer would stop writing, because I think he thought that philosophical inquiry and debate about the good suit our nature just as well as giving priority to justice does. Um, on that note, I shall stop. I'll note that we needn't conclude the session at 11.30. I don't think there's anything after this till lunch. So people can go on as long as they like. I will raise, or I will recognize questioners. Um, uh, maybe I'll move to the side in case you think you need to, to come to the microphone, um, or unless you want to speak loudly from your seats. Okay, so we have time for we have time for questions. Yes. Hi, yes. Uh, Melissa from Princeton University. I, I'd like to ask a question, um, perhaps both to Michael Zuckert and, and if uh, Paul would like to say anything. Also. Um, about the, the tensions uh, within the limits of justice that, that Michael Zuckerberg was talking about in his presentation, and whether or not another aspect of those tensions uh, is the fact that Rawls only recognizes that the tensions are the result of our selfishness, right? So he seems to think that if we fail to give political justice the priority that he thinks it ought to have, it's because we're being selfish. It's because we want to get more from our place in the natural lottery, say. And so that we need to leave those quests, leave the, the knowledge of where we fall in that lottery, for instance, out when we deliberate about basic constitutional matters and essential justice. And, okay, so I, I think that might be a problem, but I think there's an even bigger problem when Rawls says that it's likewise selfish to go into deliberation about those things armed with your knowledge of your conception of the good. Right, uh, that if your comprehensive conception of the good, be it religious or philosophical, can't go in there, Rawls says, well, if, you, if you're not willing to prioritize the political conception of justice over your comprehensive view of the good life on those things, you're being selfish. And that, it seems to me, is just to misconstrue what's going on, right? It's one thing is to say, oh, I'm being selfish if I want my wealth to be protected by the Constitution. But a whole other thing is to say that I'm being selfish because I want my Constitution to be informed by what I think is actually the good for human beings. Um, so do you think that's another aspect in which Rawls is, is failing to see the limits of uh, a political conception of justice? I'm going to say you get a yes and no answer, one yes and one no. <laughs> um, I'll say I'll say no because I deny the premise. I don't think Rawls thinks the only source of injustice is selfishness. I mean, he fully recognizes that people might, for example, try to cheat on their taxes to pass gains along to their children. That people might ask, uh, try to gain more money so that they can give it away to their favorite charity. I mean, so uh, I mean, those seem to me common sense 
views about the origins of at least some kinds of unjust, unjust behavior that are perfectly compatible with everything that he says. So, but I think the point is that those are all wrong. Whereas my thought is, would it be, for Rawls it's wrong to prioritize your comprehensive view over the political view. Morally wrong. Okay. And, so, so, and that's what I'm questioning. Um, so when they conflict in certain cases, then it's wrong to prioritize it. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I do think he thinks that, I, do, I, I mean, I do agree with that. He does say that. Um, but once we recognize that the comprehensive view, uh, or that prioritizing one's comprehensive view isn't an instance of selfishness, then the argument against him that the psychology is too narrow s seems to me to lose its grip or to be much less powerful. I mean, I th that is, I thought the argument was that Rawls is somehow misunderstanding the problems of justice and injustice because he reduces all injustice to selfishness. And I don't see that he does that. No, no, the, the, the point was that he's, he's misunderstanding it because he's not taking into account that there's a tension between respect for the freedom and equality of persons, which seems to be the first principle of justice, and a failure to respect the, the conscience rights of individuals, the, the, um, the obligation that individuals see themselves as having, as following their conception of the truth, and of allowing that to inform also their political act actions on matters of basic justice, uh, even if that's based on a comprehensive view that's in tension with the, the political conception. I, I don't want to monopolize this, Michael. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, I mean, I could say a few things. Go ahead. If please do. No, 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 please do. Uh, let me make sure I seem sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, it seems to me that the issue of, uh, well, of course, there, there are two phases of Rawls on this that are worth Distinguishing, I think, theory of justice roles and the political liberalism roles are different in important ways. Um, as far let, let me speak about the theory of justice roles for a moment. I mean, it seems to me there that the issue of the good and the way in which it needs to be bracketed out of the original position, uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. And I, 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 I have sympathy with your position, but I also have more sympathy with Rawls's position on it, maybe, than Paul thinks I do. Um, one is, uh, given the setup of the original position, we need to reach agreement in it, uh, unanimous agreement in it. And if we, let, if we allow in variable conceptions of the good, that really endangers the possibility of unanimous agreement on principles of justice. So that's, that's one, I think, one important consideration, maybe a methodological consideration, perhaps a circular consideration, as often people charge roles of, but still an important one. Second, I would say the issue is not so much selfishness, but, as, but Rawls's notion that justice means not self-favoring. Self-favoring can be, a, 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 is I think, a wider thing than um, selfishness. And that Rawls, I think, would say that is a crucial part of our original intuition about what justice is. Justice involves not self-favoring. And so to bracket the conceptions of the good would be an aspect of that. Um, and. Um, yeah, let me just leave it at that. Those are the two things I would I would say to that. Okay, um, I know Tris wants. Or is this a follow up to the previous question? Yeah, it is just a follow up because it seems like implicit in your question was. Um, Will you speak? Maybe stand up and speak. Sure. Loud. Implicit in Monica, Melissa. Melissa's question is the idea like, that Rawls wants to talk about this natural lottery, and I I agree that that's a really important part of understanding political justice is the inequality of capacities and resources, but he acts as if our conceptions of the good are some aspect of a lottery too, that conscience rights <coughs> are equally um, arbitrary for the purposes of the original position, are something that if you're in the original position, you don't know that you're going to have this concept of the good or this concept of the good, the same way that you don't know if you're going to be black or you're going to be white. Well, we have much less control of whether we're black or white or Hispanic than we have control over what we just did. And so I think that that is part of the problem with, like, he doesn't give an explanation. That's why the tension still exists, is that there's there's going to be these rights of individuals that are respected in the past and then you have the, the second people. And so I think that the tension actually doesn't conscience and, and other characteristics are different. And the, and the other characteristics, like one's conception of the good, are arguably chosen in a way that the other characteristics are not. But it's precisely to protect the freedom of choice that the liberties guaranteed in the first principle are given the, the weight and priority that they are. I mean, if that's right, then it looks like what's going on is a defense of the rights of individual conscience, not a violation. 
Um, Tris, you have a question? I want to motivate a very adverse judgment of all. I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to do that by looking at the bad consequences of the theory of fashion. Um, Michael, you uh, we heard some of the similarities between Plato and Rawls. We left out one, and that may have been your irony about Plato. Uh, but both Plato and Rawls make no place for intermediate institutions. And both of them are adverse to the family. And there's that famous passage on 511, section 77, where Rawls says maybe we don't have to abolish the family yet. As you understand, there's no greater enemy of fair equality of opportunity than the family. Now, he writes that as social welfare programs were being put into action that destroyed the black family, uh, the Hispanic family. So you might say the kind of discourse that he enabled really exploited the most vulnerable in society. And the reason was his inability to think about intermediate institutions. So now you have 72% blacks born on South Valley, 57% uh, Hispanics, and that might be an outcome, ironically, towards my solve it. I just can't believe that Walls is responsible for the birth rate of black families, but. <laughs> no, but that's it. The rate news. There's an immense amount of literature that the kind of welfare program that we developed, which went totally in uh, harmony with all of the audience, gave incentives to reproduce outside the planet, which I mean, has an immense of social impact. I would say, I mean, with response, with, uh, in response to what you said about Plato, I mean, I would say that, at least as I understand what Plato was doing, it's a kind of thought experiment in which he tries to show that. Um, the family stands in the way of the achievement of justice, either as true merit or as a true devotion to the common good. And therefore, the family is indeed abolished by Plato in the Republic. But I believe that that's part of Plato's effort to show that we cannot actually achieve true justice and that he isn't serious about abolishing the family, as I think he indicates in the laws, his other political, mainly other political dialogue, in which the family is very strongly supported. <coughs> I think he's merely trying to show something about the tension between necessary social institutions and justice. And so I, I, I guess I'd want to preserve Plato from your critique. But, uh, and, and this is a place where I think where the difference between them is, is important because Rawls is more serious about achieving genuine equality of opportunity, and that does raise problems in his mind for the, for the family. I just find it hard to believe that a theory that's never been implemented can be responsible for effects we observe. Yeah. Question? Yeah, Bob Crane, Equity Fuller University. What, what do you make of Rawls' recently published uh, writings on religion and his movement, you know, his earlier faith? And I think, if I recall correctly, that he was sort of a practicing Christian up till World War II, his experience of World War II. Something about World War II shattered his belief in providence or cosmic justice, and so that perhaps we could interpret his whole passion for justice as a kind of almost death of God moralism, you know. He wants the Christian morality without the Christian God, as it were. I mean, is, I'm just sort of speculating, but what do you think about his recently published writings on religion, which I think are quite fascinating and Yes. Uh, unknown to people until very recently. Well, two, two comments about it. You know, it's, it's hard to know, and I, I didn't want to incorporate that uh, into anything I said this morning. But two comments. One, I've been struck by how uh, careful, well, I don't want to say that. Here's another thing. The second thing I've been struck by is how when Rawls. I, I can't Princeton, quite hear you back when, here. When Rawls, as a Princeton undergraduate, was writing, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, it was discovered in the Princeton Library that Rawls wrote an undergraduate thesis in, in a kind of um, the tone, the voice of a Christian, serious Christian right. intellectual as an undergraduate at Princeton. Very well done. Uh, it's, it's, now been, it's now been published. Uh, it, it, people were fairly careful to keep the editing of that away from serious Christians, that's one thing. But the other thing that strikes me about it is how Rawls' style and his mind in that 
senior essay is so much like the style in his mind and the theory of justice, although his, his view clearly changed. I mean, he's raising these questions that he was clearly very disturbed about, about evil, the problem of evil, grace. Uh, the story that generally is held now is that after writing that, his experiences in the Second World War led him to abandon his faith. But his style of writing, I don't know what you make of that, but the way he, he argues and thinks, it, it, the prose style, the, the dialectical style, is the same as a Christian, as he was a sort of secular thinker uh, after his loss, he lost his faith. I, you know, there, there are all these stories too, but there were other writings at the end of his life. Uh, perhaps you know, do you know anything about this, Paul? That, that there were other writings that he came back to these religious things, uh, and the, there were more. It'd be very interesting to see what those were if they in fact exist. Well, his his undergraduate thesis was published with an introduction by Bob Adams, terrific philosopher of religion, who wrote a, a, a hundred page introduction to it that stands on its own as a wonderful piece of work. Um, but it was also published along with a late little essay called On My Religion. I don't know of anything other than that. <coughs> uh, cool. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Um, uh, on pain of uh, destroying my credibility as a raw scholar, I have to admit I haven't read this uh, undergraduate paper yet. Um, uh, I have always thought, though, and I thought this before this came to light, that Rawls had the sensibility of a Protestant minister, um, but not, but he didn't speak in that language, but that he's morally earnest the way New England Protestant ministers were. Um, <clears throat> I have to comment, though, on what I see as to be a great irony in this recapturing of Rawls's <clears throat> undergraduate senior thesis and people paying a lot of attention to it and people pay no attention, as far as I can tell, to his doctoral dissertation, which in my opinion is actually an extremely important um, indicator of where he's going. And David read to us <clears throat> the very brief met methodological comments that Rawls uh, includes in Theory of Justice. Uh, which uh, it, it, in which he says in that same section, he says, well, I'm here in Theory of Justice, I'm following the moral methodology of a, an article that he had published in the very early 1950s, which in turn is a kind of summary or precy of his doctoral dissertation. And um, it is interesting that he downplayed the methodology issues, but I believe they're very, very central to the Theory of Justice, in fact. And I've always been struck by the fact that raw scholars, myself excluded, because I think I am the only one I know of that pays attention to this, um, have not really paid too much attention to the er, Rawls's dissertation and that early article as well. Um, and that instead now we're getting this lavish attention on his uh, undergraduate, uh, what are they, what, is it, is it yeah. I don't know, I haven't read this. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Sure. Yeah. It, it does seem to be, and it, Related to your, your suggestion that Rawls' ambitions were much less uh, uh, grand than I suggested, I think Michael's <coughs> the dissertation and the early work suggests to me that his ambitions were great. I mean, the way I read his career, and it's, it's very complicated, mm -hmm. but it seems to me the ambitions are very big and they slowly define mm -hmm. in, in a way that I think people like Rorty track pretty, pretty well. Now, what we make of that? I don't know, but, but I would agree with Michael. That early stuff I think, is very important in understanding. And there, there are places in their justice, too, where I think we sense the ambitions. And certainly, the disciples who were closest <laughs> to him in those early days, you know, that they embodied in their work ambitions to yeah. really resolve these problems in the culture. We were going to solve them and get rid of this old-fashioned moral philosophy. And liberal culture would finally have it's, uh, if not, it's New Testament, it's Old Testament. It's something like that. <laughs> Um, Michael, no, this question comes out of, I suppose, of, of Martha Nussbaum in the background, not personal, but things that she's written. And his talk led me to ask the following direct question, and that is, why can't the liberal attachment to rights or freedom be understood as essentially a negative definition of the good. That is, the proposition is the most important thing is that I do not be a slave, i.e. that no one else dictate what you take to be good in your life. So, 
philosophies, is there really fundamentally a distinction between the good and the right? Or is the right a thin, vague conception of the good? David has to get first dibs at this because in his wonderful commentary on Alison McIntyre's inaugural lecture, The Privatization of Good, he made a reference to this point. I couldn't hear Catherine's point. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I will try. Okay. <laughs> I will come closer. It's my use. <laughs> Basic question. Common distinction. Good right. Good liberty. Why isn't right or liberty a thin, vague conception of the good? That is, why aren't we de debating two different conceptions of the good between liberalism and not, rather than the right as opposed to the good? Uh, wow. I mean, uh, I do understand the question, although I'd like to, to claim that I still can understand it because it's such a tough thing. <laughs> See, I, you know, I don't think we have any way of really making clear what we are talking about when we talk about the priority of the right and the good. I mean, this is where this comes in, the Rawls interpretation, and that's become such a slogan that, uh, I, 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 as, as Paul says, this uh, in, in a piece in the Review of Politics, I sort of crit criticized McIntyre along these same, uh, these same lines. Uh, I think in the end, the difference is that the normativity associated with the right and its connection to agency and kind of Kantian notions of, are going to be quite different from the normativity connected to notions of the good. Now, that's just a point in the direction of where I think the distinction uh, is, is to be drawn. But that's that's why I think that distinction is worked out in, in contemporary moral philosophy. And I'm just gesturing in the direction of a very complicated discussion. I, you know, I think it can go the other way if you go both ways, you can wonder why, for say, broadly deontologists, they can't bring the notion of the right closer to the good, and for uh, my kind of people, virtue people, why can't we bring uh, you know the good closer to to the right? right. You know, it, and it's this question of where norm, the character normativity is going to have in an ethical theory, and Kant is, as it were, the person in the first section of the groundwork seems to me to be the thing that's hovering over this discussion. Sorry, that's Win Bagri of the first order. <laughs> <laughs> Other hands? Yeah, Dan. Um, let's see if I can remember the original question. A question for Michael, uh, actually from the very beginning of your talk. So you, you point out this deadlock that's in the Republic. You know, how do you get the philosopher king? You can't do it you know, more loudly because I don't think people in the back can do it. Okay. How does how does one make a philosopher a king? Right. Uh, the, the philosopher doesn't want to be king. The, the subjects don't want a philosopher king. It's impossible. So implicit, I take it in the in the narrative, something that, that Plato sees that Socrates can't see is that you do it by sitting the children down, sitting the kids down, getting them while they're young, and, and telling them the story of the city in speech, right? You sit down, those who will inherit power from their fathers, will inherit popularity in the assembly, and convince them to identify their own good with that of, of the city, right? So, I mean, so you're saying that uh, within, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to understand the point, sure. that within the Republic, there may be no solution of the sort that Socrates outlines, but that outside the Outside the text, there is a solution in the sense that people in the real world can be educated in that text or about, about, about well, that text. Well, is I, that, is that let me put it this way. Yes, or yeah. maybe a clear way to put it. Uh, Socrates doesn't tell Adamantus and Glaucon, you know, here's how I'm going to get you to be philosopher kings. What he, what he, what he says is instead, what a good, what a good man is like, right? Yeah. But in saying these things, he's getting them to identify their own political achievements with the salvation of the state, right? That might be, so, I mean, he, he's doing something without letting on that he's doing it. That might be the answer to the deadlock, right? Um, but I'm not sure it's an answer that still is an answer to the deadlock. I mean, uh, uh, I've known many generations of students who have read Plato's Republic, but I'm not sure they're ready to uh, empower or foster kings. So really? it isn't clear that, that's, that Plato would understand that to be a sufficient condition for producing philosophy. I need to rethink my career. <laughs> <laughs>
fun so for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> other uh, other questions, comments. Oh oh yes. This will be the, well, I guess people are voting with their feet <laughs> or with their stomachs. All right. Uh, let's thank our speakers then. And those who have questions can come up and ask them.